Today we're going to be looking at the Batman vs. Robin and Lazarus Planet event that started 2023, and this was the event that kicked off DC's new initiative, the Dawn of DC, basically lining all of the comic books up to tell one consistent story. So this is Batman vs. Robin issues 1-4, through four, then we do Lazarus Planet for its entire run, then we go back for the epilogue in Batman vs. Robin issue number 5. I hope you guys enjoy, and if you're wondering where you are, this is Comic Story in Full Story. We cover comic books and talk about them on our main channel, Comic Story, and then we created this channel as a compilation of everything we've done there so you have it and have it available to you. Lightning cracks over Wayne Manor, illuminating someone walking up the drive. Inside, Bruce Wayne looks around at all of the old photos, memories swirling in his mind. He has no idea what force pulled him to his old home. There's a knock at the door, and Bruce opens it, his eyes widening in shock at the sight of Alfred standing before him. Master Bruce, is it really you? Alfred asks. Alfred pushes inside as Bruce stares at him. Whoever you are, this is an unforgivably poor taste. Alfred Pennyworth is dead. Bruce says, but Alfred turns on him, warning him about Bane and Thomas Wayne, what they have planned. Bruce looks at Alfred in shock, knowing that this would have been Alfred's last memories before he died. He puts a hand on his old friend, his old father figure, questioning how he could have possibly gotten here and be alive. Alfred doesn't know, so the two head into the kitchen to have some of Alfred's favorite tea. The next hour, Bruce is questioning Alfred, asking him things that only the real Alfred would know. They both finally agree to head down into the cave and give the man a full medical exam. Bruce watches as Alfred goes straight to the grandfather clock, putting in the time of his parents' death. And they head down. It's at that moment that Bruce turns the power on to the bat cave. Well, well, look what the bat dragged in, Damien says from his spot on the giant penny flanked by Tim Hunter and Jakeem Thunder. Bruce whispers over his shoulder to Alfred. He hasn't seen you yet, hide. He tells Alfred and Bruce doesn't hesitate walking forward. Took you long enough, I thought you'd never come down. Damien says with a smile as he stands. He turns to Hunter, ordering him to attack, but Bruce leaps out of the way as the magical energy explodes around him, ripping through the cave. As the smoke clears, Damien turns to his friends. He got clear. Find him and bring him to me! Damien snaps, but a voice calls out of the shadows as Batman steps out of the smoke. I give the orders here, Damien, not you. This is still my house! He growls, throwing a battering, but Damien leaves out of the way. Ha! Battering snare, your go-to. You insult me! <laughs> Hunter fires another blast, but Batman dodges it, slipping into the shadows. The young wizard steps forward looking for the bat, but Batman is behind him, knocking him unconscious, snapping the screwdriver that he was using as a wand. He turns as he hears Damien's voice. This is a declaration of war, father. I've grown exhausted waiting for you to leave your mantle to its rightful owner. Me! Damien shouts. Batman turns as Thunder steps forward, calling forth the genie that does what he commands. He brings the T-Rex to life, riding atop it as it roars and rushes at him, but Batman leaps out of the way of its stamping feet. Damien, whatever's speaking through you, stop this right now! You're putting these boys into danger! Batman shouts, leaping out of the way as several attacks come from the T-Rex, throwing a smoke bomb into the air, knocking Thunder out. Batman keeps moving, but something grabs him from behind, throwing him to the ground. He looks up in shock as several of the old Robin and Batman costumes have come back to life and have begun to attack him. It's time to put you out of my misery, detective. I've grown to hate you as you hate me. You left me on my own, rejected me. Why? Because I have Al Ghul blood running through my veins? Damien says as he leaps down, watching his father be beaten by his own suits. Is it because you blame me for Alfred's death? Damien asks, but he turns as someone steps out of the shadows. That isn't true. There's no need for blame at all, Master Damien. I beg you to come to your senses. Alfred says quietly. Batman continues to fight using a torch to burn the costumes, but Alfred steps forward offering Damien a hug. Robin moves towards him, but Blade suddenly snap out of his gloves. I don't know what to say other than I'm not falling for it. He moves into attack, but Batman is there knocking him away. Damn it, Damien! He grabs Alfred, pulling him out of the mix, and they move through the darkness of the cave with Robin following him, Tim Hunter at his side. Run all you like, father! I will find you! 
Damien shouts into the shadows and they keep moving with Tim firing magical blasts at them. Batman and Alfred finally come to a cliff, unable to continue forward. They turn seeing Damien and Tim Hunter there right behind them. I thought we could get past our disagreements, father, to find some way to be the son that you wanted. But I found something from your own past that finally opened up my eyes. Damien says, pulling out a gun and aiming it at Batman's chest. My parting gift, father, closure. Your life ends as it began. I only wish that you were wearing pearls. Damien says, and Batman moves to protect Alfred as the gun goes off, the rounds ripping through Bruce's chest. They both tumble off into the darkness with Damien staring into the pit below them. Farewell, father. But Damien is unaware that Batman has grasped a hidden ladder. Shortly after, the Batboat pulls away into the harbor with Bruce explaining to Alfred that he had to upgrade the body armor and that he managed to see the long forgotten ladder as they began to fall. Bruce explains to Alfred that they have to find somewhere to keep him safe while he tries to figure out what's going on. It doesn't matter, he's my family too, Alfred tells him, refusing to be kept safe. Bruce stares at him for a moment before embarrassing him in a hug. I miss you, old friend, Bruce says gently. Meanwhile, Damien has returned to the Tower of Fate, snapping his fingers, and Tim and Jakim fall to the ground. I regret to inform you that the detective lives. You failed. Don't give me children next time, then. The voice nods, offering Damien a magical, powerful item for him to use in his war. Meanwhile, over on the docks, Batman has taken stock of what items he has, aware that he is underprepared for this fight, knowing that the Bat family comms are probably compromised. But he does have one item that they can use, a magical key that Zatanna gave him a long time ago. This will allow him to travel to her house through any door. And as we're obviously facing a magical threat, She's my go-to expert. He tells Alfred as they step through the door, but the house is empty. He pushes through into her study where he finds Zatanna floating in the air, strangled by a noose. Hello, Bruce, she whispers in a strange voice and he begins to reach for her as she explains that she has been caught in Schrodinger's noose. I am both alive and dead for now, she whispers. The one punishing us is intent on making us suffer. She warns him, telling him that the various members of the Justice League Dark have been caught in several curses, taking them out of the equation. This must be stopped. Something in the ether is terribly wrong, Bruce, and it's Damien's doing. But Batman doesn't understand, questioning how Damien could have done all of this. I don't know, but you have to find out quickly, because death is not off the table for any of us. Use the key. It will take you to a secluded place new to you, the place that keeps all of the secrets. There you may learn exactly what Damien did. Batman nods, putting the key into another lock and opening the door into a white room. At the Tower of Fate, Damien throws aside the magical weapons around him. These are trinkets, playthings. If I'm going to topple Batman, I require greater resources. You owe me that much. How else but through me would Mother's soul have met the devil Neja? Damien asks, and he looks up at the demon flanked by his great-grandmother. In the middle of the Kentucky field, Felix Faust stares at his hands, stating that he did this to them. In the past, to dominate, to punish. But why? Why is this happening again? As he stares at his hands, he sees the miniature puppets of the Justice League on his fingertips. But this time, they're fighting back. They pinch and pull and choke their way across his body. But before he could be lost, Batman grabs him from behind, telling him to stop. His magic is going haywire. You aren't the only one. Focus! Slowly, Batman begins to tighten his grip. The small fingers beginning to shrink down until there's nothing left. But before passing out, Faust says, The devil. Batman lets go, setting him down. That was the last of the sedatives. That should take him out of play, at least for now. As Batman stares, Alfred looks off asking, what is that? What is happening to the ground? Seconds later, the ground begins to crack and split as a house begins to rise out of the opening. Batman says that maybe we don't have to go towards the magic. Maybe the magic will come to us. Alfred looks at all of the tombstones asking, what is this? Where are we? Batman tells him that he doesn't know either, but this is where Zatanna sent them. If we're going to have any chance of stopping Damien's rampage, we need to investigate. The two of them walk up and a man is waiting for them who says, b b b b batman 
to to, to what do we owe your presence on this cold, cold and dreary night and I Batman looks around. What do you mean we? The man says the house of course. And he the k -k -k caretaker. His name is Abel. As Batman and Alfred enter the dark and decrepit home, Alfred says there isn't much to speak of, is there? And Abel turns back. Shh! Don't let the house hear you. It welcomes company, particularly people with questions, but proceed with caution. Everyone who enters the House of Secrets eventually learns something they do not wish to know. But before Batman could ask his first question, Abel disappears, and he and Alfred wander into a dark room. As they step in, they feel the ground disappear and they begin to fall, but safely land as images begin to appear around them. As the images take shape, they see that it was Damien in his fight against the Lazarus demon when he fought on Lazarus Island that caused this. But Batman can also see the woman orchestrating it all. But as to who Mother Soul is, Batman doesn't know. As Damien and his friends won over the demon, Mother Soul asks if they have any idea what they've done. You've killed him! You've ruined everything! Damien tells her no, railing and raving about genocide. She is worse than her son. Flatline asks, Son? Who is she then? And Damien says that her name is not Mother Soul. It's Rul Al Ghul, soul of the demon. She is Raz Al Ghul's mother. But soon the apparitions fade away and Batman and Alfred leave the room to find a man with bloody hands awaiting them. Batman asks, who is he? And the man says that his name is Cain, of course. And Batman asks, where's Abel? Cain responds, that simpering little milk toast? Why, Batty, it's a tale as old as man. No, you're in my house and I'm taking over as your tour guide. The door opens up and Cain asks, what lies behind door number two? It's a mystery. As they step in, Batman and Alfred are seated to a play where Mother Soul takes center stage. She holds the head of her defeated demon, stating that he was the embodiment of Lazarus' magic, that this demon was untouchable, unbeatable, and thus bitterly disappointing. She has been on this island for a long, long time, and she knows the Lazarus resin better than any other, its properties, its history, how it was refined from a Chinese elixir of resurrection and immortality a millennia ago, from the blood and tears of a grieving father. Alfred whispers, asking, did you know the Lazarus Pits had an origin? And Batman responds to him, I know now. As something rises out of the pit, Mother Soul says that she witnessed this demon that yet lives be trapped, imprisoned beneath her very feet. The blood connection between the resin and the demon may be powerful enough to force his release, but someone will have to wield the key. Damien, intent on exploring the island, he shall be the one to do this. Batman stares at the demon. There has to be more pieces to this puzzle. Something about this place is clouding my memories. What am I missing? But before he could think any longer, the entire room begins to melt away until he and Alfred suddenly find themselves in the main hallway again. I'm tired of your games. I'm sick to death of playing defense. We're gonna find out what Mother Soul did to my son if I have to burn this place to the ground. As Batman throws a battering and wraps around a woman and he asks, who is she? Lilith, Eve, and the woman says, how dare you? Eve's an absolute hag. No, my name is Cynthia. How are you? Bewitched, I'm sure. She laughs, telling him that his time here is running out and they are fast approaching the witching hour. But soon Cynthia begins to transform into Talia Al Ghul. You're not her. Are you certain? Reality is shifting before you, is it not? Would you like to know the final truth about your son's sudden transformation? Come closer. As Cynthia attacks, Batman catches us, stating that Talia smells of jasmine and rose of taif. You do not. Fine, steal my fun, just watch and learn. At that moment, a trap door opens up as Batman and Alfred fall through it, but as they look, they see Damien holding the key that Mother's soul was referring to. As Damien gets closer to the tomb, Batman stares. Oh God, I remember this was his tomb. Damien, no! Damien is holding up this key to unlock the sealed stone doors, and as they explode open, there stands Neja. I remember now. Years ago, Superman and I stopped him by the skin of our teeth, and we buried him here. Alfred asks, who is he? Who did you bury here? The deadliest magical warrior who ever lived. Thousands of years old, capable of enslaving the world. 
He calls himself Devil Neja. Neja leans forward, stating that he can sense the fear in him, the child of his jailer, the son of the Batman. How perfect. There could not be a more fitting weapon to use against Batman. No more appropriate tool of revenge. Family is the nexus of all hatred. Batman kneels down, stating that that's what happened. Neja possessed Damien, and Alfred says that there must be some way to free the boy. Damien looks up and smiles. Not really. And he blasts the two of them back into the house. As Batman gets up, he sees Damien controlling the tour guides like puppets, stating that story time is over, father. Then again, my whole life is a story about a lonely, wounded boy so desperate for companionship that he invites other children into his trauma. Damien releases the puppets and begins to set the house on fire. Every story has an ending, father! And the fire? Don't look at me. You're the one who said that you wanted the house ablaze. So do us both a favor and just lie down and die. Of course, Batman does the exact opposite, and he begins to race out of the burning house. But back with Damien, Mother Soul asks if he left him to perish. And Damien says, I left Batman in a burning mansion. It's like trying to catch a rhinoceros with a butterfly net. I've achieved my goal. I've rattled his spirit. I delivered my message. I know my father. I know the next move. Even though he's acutely aware that he's being baited into a trap, it won't stop him. His greatest and more exploitable confidence in his ability to improvise under any circumstance. Mother Soul says that that is an ability unchallenged, only because he has not yet met the foe that can outthink him, and as such, she has a gift for him. Damien takes the clothing and begins to put it on, and as he steps into the light, he reveals it to be a new Batman suit. Damien looks at himself. It's exquisite, but does it come with accessories? She tells him absolutely what is Batman without Robins. Back with Batman, he stares at the burning house, and Alfred asks, what now? He tells him clearly this is more than just Damien and him, and Neja has taken his son, and that is his fatal error. He's made me angry. I can't call Superman, because he could become easily possessed. So we're going to have to find Damien to save him ourselves. Alfred says that he's at his side, and Batman begins to walk away. Thank you, old friend. I'm always at my best when you're keeping an eye on me. Of course, Master Bruce. That's what I'm here for. The light casts over Alfred and his shadow changes into the form of Neja. With Neja's hold over Damien remaining strong, Batman flies to Lazarus Island to confront his son. But Alfred poses a concerning question. He's quite happy that they found transportation to reach Damien, but how does he suppose that the boy is unaware of the plane? Batman says that Damien is well aware of all of his resources and contingencies. He would have left the plane, and only the plane, on purpose. Damien wants them to come to Lazarus Island, and they can't count on any family for backup. Batwoman, Bat-Signal, the Bat-Girls, Damien has done something to leave them all offline. Damien knows that they're coming. But through Alfred's eyes, Mother Soul watches, telling her grandson that Batman is in route. Damien turns to her. Thank you, but my Robins will not go into battle unarmed. To Timothy Drake, I give him the cloak of Caligastro. Jason Todd, the trident of Poseidon. Stephanie Brown, the coop stick of Black Bison. And Dick Grayson, the most powerful weapon, the Sword of Sin. Battle stations, everyone! By sunset, father will be dead. Back on the mainland of the island, Batman lands and tells Alfred to be prepared for anything. If Damien wishes to engage him, he'll try to wear him down. Alfred asks, how do you know? Because that's what I would do, which is why you're staying here. Alfred argues about staying on the plane, but Batman tells him that this is not up for discussion. I cannot focus if I have to worry about two people. Remember what happened when we were caught in the Riddler's Labyrinth, Alfred? Can't have that happen again. As Batman leaves for the jungle, Alfred tells him, I suppose not. Go, save your boy, sir, and be careful. As Batman enters the dense forest, he climbs up a tree to scout the foot trail left on the ground. No doubt intended for him to follow. But as he holds his position, he's suddenly struck and knocked off of the branch. A voice tells him, Keep your guard up. And it's Tim's voice. But it's too close to be hiding, which means that Tim is invisible. Batman lands a punch, but Tim appears, cracking him with his staff. I was your Robin for years, and I was damn good at it. But the minute, the minute that Damien came, you replaced me. 
Batman falls to the ground, but as he gets up, he knows that Tim is possessed and he's laying bare his deepest buried grievances. He can't take them personally. Batman yells, you grew, you didn't need me anymore. You were fine on your own. At least that's what Batman tells himself. And Tim isn't wrong. Could Batman have done better by Tim? It's startling how heavily that question weighs on Bruce. But first he needs to disrupt him. As brilliant a combatant as he is, his greatest skill is as a detective, which isn't helping him now. With a quick flick of his wrist, Batman takes off his cloak, throwing it on Tim to reveal where he is, slamming him into the ground. He ties him up and rolls his shoulder, already feeling it wrenched. He has to stay vigilant, even if this is the first trap. Back in the lower caves of the island, Neja asks a chained pig creature, Where is he? And the being laughs. After all of these centuries, and you've never learned small talk. Neja smacks him, and Mother's Soul asks who. The creature spits a mouthful of blood. My name is Zubaji. Pigs eat my friends. And yeah, me and Neja go way back. Has he told you the big secret yet about why he's doing all of this? He's not gearing to play offensively. He's playing defense. Neja hits him again, demanding to know where is he. And Pigsy says that he could have just asked because he cannot wait to see the look on his face. But he tells him he's already here on Earth. Your son has finally arrived and he cannot wait to say hello. Back in the jungle, Batman comes to an opening, but before he can hardly set foot in it, vines reach out, wrapping themselves around him. Using a small pocket laser, Batman cuts himself free and Stephanie Brown, the spoiler, tells him, you might want to hang on to that. I'm just getting started. Batman frees himself and a tree trunk falls over with Stephanie yelling, You never took me seriously! You always made me feel like a mascot, not a robin. I was clay in your hands. You could have made me into anything and you didn't even bother. There's truth in her statement. Batman could have taken the time to train her better, but he didn't. And Stephanie is now a Batgirl under Barbara's watch. As the ground erupts from underneath him, Batman is thrown off the ledge of a cliff, but Stephanie's attacks are weak. She's less of an obstacle than Tim was, which would mean she's not alone. Down on the shoreline, a wave of water shoots up, crashing into Batman. He looks behind, seeing Jason wielding the trident of Poseidon. Hey, don't worry, I'll get him. And then he hits Batman with another wave, slamming him into the wall and down to the ground. He walks right over to Bruce. We're all disposable to you, aren't we? I died and came back and you still ignored me. Why didn't you look for me? Batman throws an explosive pellet to gain some distance, but Jason absorbs them in the water, getting closer. How could you not spend every waking minute trying to save me? Once Jason is close enough to strike with the trident, Batman gets up, punching him in the stomach, telling himself that he doesn't have to answer. Why didn't he make Jason a priority? Maybe he was afraid of what he'd find, afraid of what he'd have to own up to, a ward that he'd let turn into Joe Chill. Batman wrestles the trident from Jason's hands, hitting him on the side of the head, and then rides the water back up to the cave with Stephanie, where he makes quick work of her. He groans, already feeling himself in pain, but with three of the Robins down, only one remains. The first one. Hand to hand, the toughest of them all. Back in the cave, Damien walks up to Pigsy. I know you. Yeah, we met. You were much nicer then. And now, magically, you're his puppet. But I do have a question. Damien tells him, I don't care. Are you sure? You're kind of sensitive to this stuff. Deep down, there's a part of you pushing against Neja's control, or else you wouldn't be standing here. After a few moments pass, Damien finally asks, what is the question? And Pigsy simply asks, what do you get out of all of this? Damien goes on explaining that Mother Soul's goal is to do what Roz wanted to do, but better. Pigsy just turns it on him again. Right, but what about you? Damien tries to think, but as he speaks, he begins to stutter. Yeah, that's what I thought. Kid, Damien, listen. I've known Neja since we were both young. He used to be a hero, did he not? But all of this Lazarus juice that he used to make himself immortal and pump up his magic, it's corruptive, corrosive. Damien says that he understands. This corruption, can it be reversed? At that moment, the fiery green hand of Neja grabs Damien from behind. It is not corruption, it is clarity. Using that fire, Neja burns Pigsy's face to melt his mouth shut. But back over topside, the sun begins to set as Batman reaches a cave, getting out of the brush. Alfred runs out. Thank God, Master Dickies! Nightwing sits a perched a rock. And Batman tells him, I see him, quite the dramatic entrance. Ha <laughs> ha! 
You know me, forever the showman, Bruce. With no supplies left, Batman pulls off the utility belt as his only weapon to fight with. Nightwing asks him, Do you remember that I was in the circus, right? People used to come by the thousands to see the Flying Graysons. Their applause was electric. The rush was unbelievable. Then you came and you took it all away. You hid Dick Grayson behind a mask. Batman thinks for a moment. Nightwing has never said anything like that before. Should he have realized it? And Nightwing yells, I could still show off as long as nobody knew that it was me. Robin lived so that Dick Grayson could die. They both begin to struggle as Batman thinks back to what Damien said. It was similar, that he could have given any of these kids an ordinary, normal life free of danger. Instead, oh God, what kind of monster am I? I don't deserve to win here. Who am I to fight them, punish them simply for, wait, that sword, that's Azrael's sword of sin and manifests a guilt and doubts it in the opponent's mind and magnifies it for them. It's been working on me since I arrived. Well played. Nightwing swings again, hitting Batman's arm, telling him, I'm under orders from Damien that he gets the killing blow, but I have seniority. Nightwing swings again, this time cutting into Batman's chest and Alfred yells out, be careful, he's out of defenses. Batman looks back, grabbing Alfred by the arm and as Nightwing swings again, he shoves Alfred in the way as a shield. As the sword plunges into Alfred's stomach, there's a moment that Nightwing takes brief control of his mind just long enough for Batman to knock him out. Alfred falls over and he bleeds green. You knew that you were a spy? I knew within three minutes and you just kept confirming it. It was the small things about how you spoke, like when we had tea, the real Alfred despises Oolong tea. And when I mentioned the Riddler's Labyrinth, you didn't deny it, but there never was a Riddler's Labyrinth. You knew enough about Alfred's life to answer all of my questions, but not enough to contradict me when you thought I was telling the truth. I played along as to not alert your master, but now what I want is for you to tell your master that I'm coming. Give him a message that I'm not leaving without. But the wounds of the day catch up to Batman as he falls to his knees. The demon within Alfred's body escapes laughing and flies away throughout the mountains, and Batman looks back at Alfred, taking off his mask, exhausted, and Alfred speaks. Batman looks at him. It's impossible. That voice, it's softer than before, more gentle, more authentic. No, this is just another trick. Tell your master. But Alfred chimes in. No, Master Bruce, it's me. In a sense, to properly replicate me, Measure required the tiniest echo of my actual soul, the faintest whisper. He had to crack the door to the afterlife to seize it, and now it's fading. The sword. Oh God, I've killed! But Alfred pauses him again. No, you did not. I am nothing more than a shadow. This was never a way to get me back. But I refuse to go until you accept something, Bruce. Damien imagines that I blame him for my death. I do not. He, of course, blames himself, and I will not allow that. You were half a world away. Not even you could have possibly prevented it. This is unnecessary remorse. I can find no peace while watching you carry an unearned burden. Batman stops him, but, and Alfred interrupts him again. Do you really wish for me to be disquieted for all eternity? Don't cheat me out of agency. Or I will be quite cross, Bruce. Neja exploited a wound in you. I'm asking you to close it so that you can find strength and healing. You'll need it to save Master Damien. Batman holds Alfred close. I, I miss you, Alfred. And Alfred begins to fade. We will meet again, my dear boy. Your parents, they send their love. Alfred's body begins to fade into nothing. And Batman takes a deep breath pulling up the cowl and beginning to bandage himself. Once ready, he stands up, beginning to walk into the mountain cave. As Neja enters the final stages of obtaining the power from the Lazarus Pits, there's only two things that are on Mother Soul's mind that could stop this. Batman and the mention of Neja's own son, King Firebull. Mother Soul says that she saw the look on his face when there was a mention of his son. And Neja says, fearful for him for the violence that must be done to him should he be foolish enough to confront him. 
Meanwhile, Batman is quietly sneaking into the caves that lead to the Lazarus Pit when he sees the pile of exhausted magic users just discarded after having been drained of their powers. All but one, Black Alice. Black Alice more so siphons magic into what is quite obviously Dr. Fate's helmet. As Batman moves closer to the helmet, it is positively crackling with power and a familiar voice asks if this is his idea of a sneak attack, because his footsteps carry. Batman looks up to see Damien, who can see that he is as intense as he has ever been. He has never wanted it to come to this, but all he can do is engage him. Batman looks at the things that Damien is carrying, asking, You come after an unarmed man with weapons? Is that what I taught you, cowardice? Damien throws the weapons to his side, charging in. But Batman already knows Damien is well versed between many fighting techniques from his training with the League of Assassins. Paired with the skills that he taught him, Damien is a fighting force to be reckoned with. But while Damien continues to get in his hits, Neja and Mother Soul watch from afar. As Dr. Fate's helmet reaches its limits of power, Batman tries to formulate a plan to remove it but Damien takes the opportunity to strike just as he was distracted, breaking his arm. Mother Soul says that as compelling as that battle can be, she strongly suggests that they focus their attention on the helmet before it overloads with power. Damien continues to beat Batman down, but then suddenly stops when he sees Batman not even fighting back. He leans down, grabbing him by the neck. Wait, you knew this was a death trap but Batman never enters a trap without a plan. What is your plan? What is it, old man? The mistake that Damien made was assuming that this was Batman's first recon through the caves, when it was in fact his second. Just as Neja gets ready to put on the Dr. Fate helmet, Batman calls out to Talia. Because on Batman's first run through on the cave, he found Talia held captive and he freed her and told her to wait for his signal when he needed her the most. As Talia kicks the helmet out of Neja's hands, it falls to the ground, bouncing when there is suddenly a flash of light. As everyone looks over again, they see Batman floating there with Dr. Fate's helmet, overflowing with power. The first thing he commands of Neja is to release his hold on Damien and the others, restoring the power to those that lost it. As Damien regains his senses, he shouts for his father to forgive him, but Batman looks down to his son. I already have. Now go help Talia while taking down Soul. Batman looks around seeing through the eyes of the sorcerers in how they see the world. It is so vastly different. Neja yells out to him, Congratulations for your unearned acquisition. For all the good it will do you. The two begin their mental combat as Batman grabs Neja from behind shouting, Why bother stopping me? The people of this planet are weaklings bent on destroying themselves. We could remove their chaos, inspire them, give them a purpose with honor. Neja then pulls Batman into the magical realm asking, what is your purpose if not to be a follower? Batman doesn't even hesitate. Right here, right now, is to be a father that my son needs. Meanwhile, Talia and Damien are cornered by an endless pit telling Mother Soul to surrender. Talia looks to her son. She won't, she's an Al Ghul. Yet she is oblivious to the truth. She conscripted you to find the demon of the Lazarus Island not once but twice, unaware that it was a wasted effort. For the demon of Lazarus Island is her. The demons must be consigned to the deepest pits of hell. Mother Soul laughs at her. <laughs> you won't murder me, not with the boy around. Why would you think that he would allow that? Talia pushes Mother Soul off the ledge, but Damien reaches down grabbing her by the arm telling her to hold on. With a smirk, Mother Soul flicks her wrist to shake off Damien's grip, falling into the darkness. As Mother Soul fades from view, Talia tells Damien that she forbids him to mourn her. But Damien says that he is not a monster. He will feel how he feels. Back with Batman, the battle of magic continues with each side claiming one hit after the other. But with one of those hits, Neja lunges for the helmet and as Batman struggles to keep the helmet, it explodes in a bright green flash. The broken pieces clatter as they fall to the ground and into the pit, and without its power, Batman falls to the ground as well. Neja stands over him asking, How dare you, a mortal, imprisoning me, cheating me, defying me? This is over. 
as Neja reaches down, he is struck behind by Damien, wielding one of the magical items he presented to him. Batman yells for his son to get back, but Neja turns his focus on Damien. Such is the punishment of disloyalty. A blast leaves his fingers, and Batman throws himself in the way to save his son. Talia rushes over to check on Batman, and Damien asks if he's... Talia checks his pulse. He's gone. I'm sorry, son. Neja laughs. <laughs> this pain is enough. And Damien shouts at the monster. You will pay dearly for this! Just then, there's an explosion of rock as King of Fireball bursts in through a wall, continuing Damien's sentence. There will be so much more! King of Fireball attacks Neja. Pigsy and Alice run up with Pigsy grabbing Damien. We have to hurry! There's still a chance that all is not lost! The Lazarus pits are fast becoming exponentially more volatile. They won't resurrect Batman, they'd boil him instead. But there is still Lazarus magic available to us through Neja's own veins. Black Alice places her hands on Batman's chest, siphoning out the magic from Neja himself, putting it into Batman. As Neja falls to his knees, losing his powers, Damien looks at Batman. It's not working! And suddenly Batman sits up, gasping for air. Talia checks on him and Pigsy says that they won't have time to see if Batman is actually okay. They need to get out of here. Neja then begins his own escape, with King Fireball yelling, No! I will not be denied my vengeance! Not even if the whole world has to suffer! King of Fireball rockets out of the cave, and it damages it enough to start a collapse. Dozens of stones fall into the Lazarus pit, causing it to violently explode, taking out the entire island as a Lazarus volcano begins to erupt across the world. The plane barrels through the storm as Damian Wayne is at the controls. Black Alice sits next to him and Talia al Ghul in the back, cradling a wounded Batman. I'm going to fix this, Robin tells them, and Batman struggles to look at his son. The Lazarus Volcano. What's the aftermath? He asks, but his radio beeps and Supergirl's voice comes over the Justice League line. Attention, this is Supergirl with a planetary alert. Anyone not already engaged is to report to the Hall of Justice immediately. Supercharged weather conditions created by a magical rain are blanketing the Earth. Lightning crashes outside of the plane, and the engines suddenly stop. Great, Robin whispers as he struggles at the controls, but the plane is dropping out of the sky at an increasing rate. Everyone, brace for impact! He shouts out, and the plane goes down, slamming into the Hall of Justice. But Supergirl and Power Girl are there to stop it. Enemy attack? Power Girl asks as they slow the plane. X-Ray Vision says no. Supergirl tells her with a shake of her head. Robin and the others struggle from the crash, and the young hero faces those that have gathered around him. Attention, everyone! We are at war with an ancient evil that goes by the name of King Fire Bull. He is responsible for the green storms, but there is a way to stop him. As murmurs begin to go through the crowd as they realize they're listening to a child, Batman looks up. Listen to my son. Robin quickly fills them in on the events that led here warning them that the storm will play havoc with magic and science-based powers, but they need to separate into two teams, with one team heading to the Tower of Fate to retrieve the magical artifacts that Neja drained and bring them to Black Alice so that she can reverse what happened. The second team will go searching for Neja himself so that they can force him to aid them in the battle against his son, King Firebolt. I'll manage any late arrivals. Monkey Prince stays with me. It doesn't take long for the heroes to arrive at the Tower of Fate. Power Girl, Zatanna, Mary Marvel can't seem to get through the magical defenses, so Cyborg and Blue Beetle give it a try. But when they hit the tower with their alien tech, there's a massive explosion that throws them away. That wasn't the tower. Where did that come from? Cyborg gasps. A voice calls out behind him, and that's when he sees the massive Minotaur-like creature, lightning flashing behind the monster as it speaks. From me! I was sent to guard the tower. I take pride in my work. Zatanna looks up in shock. The Silverhorn King, one of King Fireball's two lackeys. This is bad, she tells Power Girl. Massive wolves jump past the Silver King as he orders them to attack our heroes. Rend them limb from limb. He bellows as the heroes meet with the magical monsters. Meanwhile, the second team has arrived at the Himalayas. It's there that they meet the Golden Horn King. Humble servant of the King Fireball. 
He has sent me to retrieve the coward Neja. He says from his perch, and Supergirl steps forward, motioning Batman and Talia away. Blue Devil and I have this. You two go, she says. But even though her powers have been altered by the magical rain, she rushes forward, with Blue Devil keeping the Golden Horn busy long enough for Supergirl to throw a massive boulder at him. As they push forward to the temple, Batman and Talia discover that Neja is fighting against Swamp Thing and Poison Ivy inside. How do they beat us to him? Talia says in surprise. But as the rest of the heroes are fighting against the Silverhorn's wolves, Mary Marvel punches him once more in the face. Your efforts are embarrassing, child. The rain hits harder than you. He says with a laugh, but Power Girl suddenly swoops in, grabbing the Silverhorn by the head, flying him up into the air. As they leave, the wolves are growing weaker, and Zatanna is able to contain them. Meanwhile, Supergirl continues to fight, but the Golden Horn's power of fear begins to overtake her. Blue Devil shouts to her, reminding her that Supergirl never submits to fear, and she looks up with anger in her eyes. You're right, she says, slamming her hands together, performing a super clap that topples the mountain around them. That'll hold him for a bit at least, she says, grabbing Blue Devil and flying them to safety. Inside of the temple, Talia rushes to Poison Ivy, demanding to know what she is doing there. You people have forgotten that I have a PhD in botanical studies. Once Swamp Thing and I determined that the Lazarus of Resin was falling out of the sky, we came here to learn more about how it was affecting his realm, the Green. But Neja has already had enough, ripping clear of Swamp Thing's attacks. Enough! The Devil Neja cowers before no one. Victory can still be mine. He shouts, but Supergirl appears, blasting him with heat vision. Weakened, Swamp Thing and Ivy manage to restrain Neja and allow the others to blast him until he finally falls. At the Tower of Fate, the storm is ripping through the area with magical lightning crashing against the ground, threatening to kill everybody. Mary looks up, back at the tower. Everyone, fall back from the tower! Way, way back, she shouts, speaking the magic word. Shazam! And her lightning falls from the sky, cracking the tower of fate open. After everyone comes back, Blue Beetle looks at the tower in surprise. I thought we were here for tridents and stuff. What's with the sleepover? He asks as everyone looks up to see the magic users of the universe stepping out of the tower's ruins. The magic users collect their weapons and prepare for the fight, with Zatanna looking at her group and smiling. I think we got it. Finally. A fighting chance. Back over at Neja's temple, he has fallen. The heroes gather around him, and Supergirl can hear a faint heartbeat within. She's not sure if they can use Neja's magic to heal Batman, to finally revive him fully from the dead, but she looks up to see black smoke curling around the dark night and he begins to take on a monstrous appearance. No need, I'm feeling better than ever. He growls at her. Meanwhile, over at the Hall of Justice, Damien looks up from his computer as the wall suddenly caves inward. Who's there? He shouts. King Fireball smiles at him as he steps out of the smoke and the rubble. You know my name. Call me King Fireball. We now go to one of the one-shots, Assault on Krypton, to discover some of the new powers hitting some of your favorite superheroes. Earlier, Dreamer was going about her day when she was suddenly hit with a vision of Robin crashing his plane into the Hall of Justice. Everything was bathed in gold, and she sees her vision is reflected in the Helmet of Fate. When she comes to, she leaps through Bruce's dreams and pops out of the Hall of Justice. Robin, the future, I can't! She gasps as the images flood through her mind, but Damien helps her to her feet, asking what is she talking about. The future, it's gone dark, she tells him, and she quickly explains what she saw, telling him that it was reflected in the golden helmet. Damien and Supergirl fill Dreamer in on what happened with Neja, and they explain that they are outmatched when it comes to King Fireball. Not with the helmet, we aren't. We get the helmet, we restore the future. Where is it? Dreamer asks. Batman struggles up from his bed, explaining that Khaled is the current Doctor Fate. Or he was. Until Neja undoubtedly bested him for it. Dreamer nods. Do you think he'll know where we can find it? She asks, and Batman believes that Khaled might know where the helmet is. But he points out that Khaled isn't responding to their summons to the Hall of Justice. But Dreamer believes that she might be able to track him through his dreams and figure out his location. She quickly drops into the dream world, appearing in a hospital next to Dream Khaled. Watch where you're going, nurse! 
he says to her as he pushes past, but he doesn't know her and doesn't realize he's in a dream. Listen to me, you are Khaled, Dr. Fate. You wear the helmet of fate. It was taken from you and I need you to show me where it is. It's time to wake up. The Khaled shrugs her off, continuing on in his dream. That's when a voice calls out to her. It's no use, let him go. The voice tells her, letting her know that he is buried deep within his own subconscious, trapped by Neja. His connection to the Helmet of Fate remains, buried even deeper in his mind than himself. For now, it sleeps, lying dormant until it's found. Within the Helmet also resides a fragment of myself. Khaled cannot guide you to what you seek, but I can. Dreamer keeps walking until she finds an exit door that glows. She opens it, revealing a long staircase going downward, and the voice continues to talk to her, letting her know that fate flows through her. She finally arrives at the Helmet of Fate. The voice thanks her as she reaches out for it. And with that, Dreamer breaks the surface of the Lazarus Pit, the real Helmet of Fate clutched in her hands as she is screaming out. Meanwhile, over in Metropolis's Garment District, a looter has broken into a store and stolen a jacket. As he walks out, he finds Superboy, Jonathan Kent, waiting for him. You want to go ahead and put that back? John asks as he floats above. But it looks so good on me, the looter says with a smile. When suddenly the magical Lazarus storm rips through the planet, the rain instantly affecting John and he falls out of the sky. Ha! You alright? You don't look. The looter says as John hits the ground, and then as he reaches out to him, electrical energy suddenly begins to swirl around John Kent. The looter steps back, his eyes blazing as fire swirls from his hands. Later, John sits up on the looter's couch. Look who's up! You exploded! That happened a lot? The looter asks. John is shocked as the looter explains that a mysterious volcano has erupted and is causing a rain that is affecting everyone. It's all over the news. You're gonna love the powers that I ended up with, the looter says with a smile, holding up the trash bin. You should take off your wet cape. You're um, still sparkling. John knows that his new powers are dangerous, but people are still in need of his help. I can help you with the city, the looter says, explaining that his name is Ash and joining John in the city. Though he's not very good at flying and constantly running through things, the two of them stop several robbers and looters. Don't even think about looting, John reminds him, and Ash smiles as he takes looted sunglasses off of a different looter. Is it really stealing if I take it off the looter? Ash asks him, and John just folds his arms across his chest. Yes. They continue to help, but John's powers are still affected, and he suddenly drops out of the sky. Luckily, Ash manages to catch him. I know you only let me tag along so you didn't have a super-powered thief on the loose while you saved the city, but I hope I made myself useful, he says as he helps John to his feet. Ash suddenly stumbles again, though. What's going on with you? John asks him. I think what powers I had were temporary. Looks like my joyride is really over. Ash knows that he's about to be arrested for what he did. But John offers to put in a good word for him because he helped the city. You're sweet, Boy Scout. Maybe when I get out, you can take me flying, Ash tells him. Later, John returns to Ash's apartment to retrieve his cape. But he's shocked to find that it is gone, and only a note from Ash remains. On the nearby television, the news reports of a fire-based prisoner that managed to escape from County Lockup. The storm continues to rage outside, but King Firebull has arrived at the Hall of Justice. He reaches out a massive hand, grabbing Black Alice by the throat. Your world's magic has run amok. It has gathered itself in a hellstorm that has enveloped your entire planet, but I know it can be reclaimed. This sorcerer, I'm told she can return it to where it belongs. What I have decided is, it belongs to me. Robin and Monkey Prince open the attack, but their blows do nothing to the mighty beast. At the ruins of the Tower of Fate, Zatanna has gathered the depowered magic users of the universe. We're all spent, see? How do we fix it? Alice Scott asks, barely controlling the energy swirls around Zatanna as she explains that they need Black Alice to return the magical powers to the appropriate users. Zatanna casts a spell to pull Black Alice to them, but King Firebull holds on tight. You think you can escape me? You are sorely mistaken. He rumbles, holding Alice tight as the spell is now threatening to rip her apart. Robin tries to warn Zatanna over the comms, but the storm is blocking their electronics. 
The Monkey Prince leaps forward, kicking at King Firebull, stunning him long enough to get Black Alice clear. King Firebull then turns to attack them, but is knocked to the ground by a blast of heat vision. Robin smiles as he looks up at the gathering of heroes, now here to stop King Firebull. Sorry we're late. Metropolis needed us. Superman says as he flies forward, grabbing the Demon King. He tosses King Fireball away, allowing the Flash, Wonder Girl, and the Green Lanterns to pelt him. Well, well, King Fireball says as he lashes out with magical energy, knocking the heroes away. Monkey Prince and Alice watch, but she tells him that she is needed and wishes to aid in the fight. She then disappears in a swirl of magical energy, leaving our heroes to battle the magical villain. She appears in the ruins of the Tower of Fate. She warns Zatanna about what is happening at the Hall of Justice. Over at the Hall, the heroes continue their battle, but King Firebull refuses to go down. Alice begins to rise into the air as she gathers the destroyed magical energy around her. Alice, you can't fix all of us at once. I forbid it, Zatanna shouts, but Alice looks at her. It doesn't stop. You don't say. Corrigan, you're up first. Get ready. Alice shouts. The fight at the hall continues, but everyone's powers are suddenly being scrambled by the magical storm. Barry suddenly has super strength as Superman falls to the ground. John Jean's telepathy clouds his mind. Damien leaps forward, blasting at the King Fireball with heat vision. I could get used to this, he shouts. And at the Tower Ruins, Jim Corrigan is once again fused with the power of the Spectre. At last, free! Free to wreak vengeance upon evil, the spirit shouts. Damien stumbles back from the computer trying to warn Batman's team, but he is unaware that Batman is actually possessed by the devil Neja and has defeated his own team. The fight continues on, but King Firebolt defeats some of the most powerful heroes, one by one dropping them to the ground. He smiles as he stands over the bodies of the fallen heroes. I expected more, but I understand. I too was human once. Human, and therefore, pitiful. At the tower, Alice gives the last of her energy to return the magic to the world, to stop the storm. And she disappears in a blast of light. In the mountain temple, the Neja Batman can sense the return of magic, and he reaches out to his son, King Fireball, speaking to him, interrupting his attempt to control the heroes. No more, my son. You have sown the seeds of your own destruction. I had hoped to absorb Earth's magic myself, but that was a fool's goal. No, energy this formidable can never be controlled, not by you, not by anyone, but it can be directed. And that's when he begins to focus his energy into King Fireball. Damien watches in shock as King Fireball seemingly is arguing with himself before he is struck by a massive, magical lightning bolt. The energy dissipates revealing a smoking King Fireball. Is that your best? You expect me to submit from that? King Fireball asks, but the glowing light fills the room, and King Fireball looks up to see a gathering of the magical heroes prepared to battle against him. The magical heroes step forward and they hit him with everything that they've got, magical energy slamming into the demonic warrior. No, it will not end like this! King Fireball shouts, but the Spectre steps forward, one of the most powerful beings in the entire universe. Enough! The terror you wish to command will be reflected upon you, so says the Spectre. Using his powers, he traps King Fireball in a small sphere of magical energy. We will find a proper resting place for you and your evil, Spectre says before disappearing. The heroes all begin to rise back up, but the Spectre and the demon are gone. I don't see Black Alice, Zatanna. Why don't I see Black Alice? Damien asks Z, and she lowers her eyes. I'm sorry, Black Alice is gone. She sacrificed herself to bring magic back to the world, but Zatanna is unaware that Black Alice didn't die, and she's elsewhere in the world, searching for peace. After the heroes have left, going to their separate homes and their separate cities, Damien is left alone. He looks up as his father, Batman approaches, seemingly healed of his Lazarus sickness. Father, did you find Neja? Are you healed? What happened to the others that were with you? Damien asks as he hugs his father. Batman smiles as his eyes begin to glow, and Damien is unaware. Don't worry, 
Everyone is accounted for, or will be soon. The shadow of Neja casts upon the wall behind Batman. After the events of Lazarus Planet, the heroes of the world have gone back to their homes, but Robin has been captured. The demon Neja is inhabiting the body of Batman and brought Damien back to the Batcave. Robin awakens to find himself hanging upside down and Batman standing before him. Neja, I sent Batman and a team to capture you. I gather it didn't go as planned. Robin asks, seemingly unafraid. Neja smiles, demanding to know. Where is King Firebull? I still wish to humble my son. Robin doesn't reveal the fact that he doesn't actually know, asking Neja to release him so that he can show him. He walks over to the computer and puts on a set of earphones. If I can still monitor the computers, I can show you a map. He explains. But that's when Robin hits the emergency alarm button, blasting 150 decibels into the cave, which throws Neja to the ground. Robin rushes over to his motorcycle, quickly roaring out of the cave. He looks behind him as the Batmobile explodes out of the ground. As Neja quickly gives chase, missiles launch into the air, and Robin is barely able to maneuver around them. Suddenly, his radio crackles to life. Damien, are you there? Can you hear me? Talia asks, quickly telling Damien that Batman has been possessed. Damien steers around another blast. I know! I have to find a way to escape! Damien tells her. But Talia tells him that Neja's life energy is the only thing keeping Batman still alive. If you remove it, he's going to die! She explains. Robin looks up as the monkey prince suddenly appears on the handles of the motorcycle, almost veering out of control. Hi! Monkey prince says with a smile. Where did you come from? Can you go back there? Robin asks him, but Monkey Prince explains that he is here to help. He reaches down, pulling out a bit of the fur from his arm, blowing on it. Suddenly, two Monkey Princes are leaping at the pursuing Batmobile, distracting it. The Batmobile swerves out of control, crashing into a tree, giving Robin some room to maneuver and finally breathe. All right, I admit that was a solid flex. Can you make some Supermen next time? He asks as the pair sneak off into the woods. As they're fleeing, Monkey Prince explains that the longer that Neja stays in Batman's body, the stronger his magic will become. He finally whirls around, grabbing a hold of Robin. Look, I don't know any other way to say this, but I'm sorry. In order to save the world, you're going to have to kill your dad. Are you prepared for that? Robin stares at him for a moment. I have no other option, he says quietly. But Robin has a plan. He sends Monkey Prince on a mission heading to Gotham, where he gathers the Bat family atop the GCPD. He calls to Neja with the Bat signal. A portal opens up and Batman steps out. You dare summon me, Bat Whelp! But the Bat family is waiting. Nightwing rushes in, drawing blood as he smashes Batman across the face with his escrima sticks. The Batgirls are next, the three of them whirling and kicking. Red Hood opens fire while Tim Drake attacks from the side, but even the gathering of skill within the family isn't enough. Batman finally throws them all clear. Get away from me! Monkey Prince then arrives and Robin puts the second part of his plan into action. Monkey Prince begins to pull out more fur, creating dozens of clones of Damien leaping into the fight. Neja is surrounded and brought down as the Robins attack him again and again. But the clones quickly disappear and Robin is left alone, punching Neja in the face, bringing him down, trying to choke him out. As Batman begins to rise, the magic users arrive, bringing the mortal body of Neja with them. Satana, Enchantress, and Pigsy all use their magic to hold Devil Neja to the ground, binding him. Tell me this is going to work! Robin shouts to them, but Pigsy informs him that it will. That Zatanna and Enchantress will be powerful enough to put Neja's soul back into his body. Then do it! Look at him! He's already recovering! Robin shouts, and Enchantress looks at him. Are you certain, Robin? Batman cannot... Are you fully aware of what you are asking us to do? Robin nods. Yes, one billion life in exchange for millions. Billions! So the two magic users work their magic and the soul of Neja is ripped out of Batman's body and put back where it belongs. Robin stands over the fallen body of his father, with Monkey Prince putting an arm around to console him. But Robin brushes him off. Save it, Enchantress, now! Transfer all of my life energy into my father! Everyone is shocked by Damien's words. The world needs Batman, not me. But Enchantress shakes her head. Damien, 
it's not enough. Pigsy steps forward explaining that Neja's magic has damaged Batman's body too much, that it is little more than a shell, that one soul is not enough to heal him. So Robin looks around at the entire Bat family in shock. Can you take pieces? Some from all of us! He motions to the rest of them, knowing that they would all give a piece of their soul to heal Batman, to heal their father. But Satana shakes her head. I'm so sorry. I gladly would give myself for this man, but a handful of fragments aren't enough either. Do you know how many people would give a part of themselves in order for Batman to live though? She asks and Robin looks at the ground for a moment. I hope so. Robin sends out a message to all the people in Gotham City, to everyone that believed in Batman and to those who think that he is just a myth, to those that he has protected individually and to those that never knew that they were saved. He asks the people of Gotham, the people that Batman has dedicated his life to, to give up a small piece of their soul so that Batman may live again. The people give it gladly, raising their hands and chanting that everyone is Batman. Everyone is Batman. Lightning cracks through the sky as the magic works. And Batman rises once more. He sits up in shock, with Robin quickly rushing to his side. It's all right, father. You're safe now. He tells him, hugging his father, it's over, he says softly. And so Batman and Robin are once again together, protecting Gotham, protecting the world as the dynamic duo. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. The next one on the docket is to cover Night Terrors, which is the next event that happened within the Dawn of DC. And I want to start getting those out over here, the stories that we haven't covered on Comic Story yet, but as a collective for the Dawn of DC over here.